What's up guys? I'm Sarah Weaver and welcome back to True Crime Tuesday. Um, if you don't know, if you're new here, True Crime Tuesday is a day where I do my makeup, tell you guys a true crime story, all of that at the same time. Okay? The same time I know. Crazy. But this week we have a great story for you, so stick around, okay? And if you like these kind of videos, hit the subscribe button below. Hit the notification bell so you can know every week when I post a new video and um, you know give it a like if you want. Comment below. I'd love to hear from you guys. Also follow me on Instagram. I'll link my handle below or I don't know if I can link it but it'll be there in the description box. So without further ado let's get into this week's story about the happy face killer. already getting hot in this sweatshirt like I don't know why I decided that would be a good idea just we're just gonna roll with it okay if you see some sweat coming down don't worry okay all right so just a reminder I do leave all of the products that I use on my face um, in the description bar below so if you're curious what I'm using or anything like that it's all gonna be down there any information you might need will be in the description box so this story starts with Keith Jesperson who was born in Chilliwack I think that's how you say it British Columbia Canada um, in 1955 and unfortunately we have another story of a man who basically had a rough childhood, you know, he was bullied in school, um, he had a rough home life, his father was a violent alcoholic who, you know, abused him, and um, unfortunately, it sounds like he was the one out of all of his siblings that would get picked on by his father, so... He really, like, didn't understand, you know, why he was getting picked out of all of his siblings and stuff like that. And I think, obviously, that is going to affect you. You are just like, why me? All of that stuff. So it also said that Keith was always a larger child. You know, he got picked on for his size. You know, kids are just mean. It's like... It doesn't matter what part of the country you live in or what country you live in, period. It's like all young kids are just the same. They're mean, you know, they'll always pick on the person who looks a little different for that, looks a little different from them and all of that stuff. It's just shitty, but it happens, right? During this time, um, his... I don't know if his parents or his grandparents noticed, but he was known to like torture animals and things like that from a young age. And usually that tends to be a sign of someone who's a sociopath or, um, you know, would turn out to be a serial killer in the future. I mean, a lot of people are able to deal with that, have, you know, coping mechanisms when they're abused and bullied and things like that. But other times, like I've said before, this is what happens, you know, these kids, like, they don't understand, they just shut off their feelings, they shut off any emotion, and that part of their brain is just like, ruined, and they can't get it back. So yeah, basically, you know, Keith would be out there torturing animals that he would find, um, birds, squirrels, all kinds of things, cats, all that stuff. So along with torturing these animals, Keith actually showed signs of um, being violent toward his other classmates and friends when he was younger. One of the boys, he actually ended up beating really badly and his father had to pull him off of the kid and 
I just picture like that scene from a Christmas story where <laughs> Ralphie is just beating the crap out of that bully and his mom has to come over and pull him off. You know the one I'm talking about, right? So that happened. And then there was another incident on top of that where there was a boy at the pool who I guess, I don't know if he was playing around or being mean to Keith, but he pushed him and like held him down under the water at the pool um, until Keith completely just blacked out. And to get his revenge on this boy, of course he does the same thing in return. So on another day when they're there swimming at the pool, he pushes the kid's head underwater and the lifeguard has to jump in and pull him off or he would have drowned the kid completely. So he just, you know, started acting out and started doing these things from a very young age. And obviously you'll see what that leads to in the future, if you can't tell already. So also while Keith was in school, he moved to Sella, Washington, where he also had trouble fitting in. Um, his classmates would make fun of his size once again. Um, and his brothers even started chiming in and they would call him Igor and Ig and things like that. Um, just really mean, like, especially when your own family is starting to, like, chime in on the bullying. Um, so obviously that really hurt Keith and affected him. And it was like, you know, he couldn't even get a fresh start at his new school. He just still was the outcast. And it just seemed to carry with him all through high school and, and beyond. And if this tells you anything about his size, it said that he, by the time he was 35 years old, he was about six, seven and a half, and he weighed 240 pounds. So this was a big guy, but like, I just hate that people made fun of him for that, you know? Like, ugh. I hate bullying. Like, I hate it so much. And... Like, if you, I just feel like if you don't like a person, same with, like, social media bullying, all that stuff. Like, if you don't like somebody, or if you don't like this video, or you don't like me, or whatever, just click off the video. Just move on with your life. You don't need to say anything to me, you know? You don't need to make me feel bad about myself. If you have constructive criticism for someone, sure, give it. Maybe um, it's something that could be helpful. I don't know, but... Once you start, like, crossing that line and making fun of someone or just, like, outright being mean just to be mean, you know, I I don't understand that. I never will. Like, those people are just so unhappy with themselves, obviously, that, you know, they don't want anyone else to be happy. Okay, sorry for that uh, tangent, but that just, it just makes me so mad when I hear about that stuff. So because of his size too, I think, um, and just the fact that he probably, you know, wanted to be in a power position um, in his career. He wanted to become a Royal Canadian Mounted Police man, police officer. <laughs> oh, I don't know what I'm saying, guys. He wanted to be a police officer in Canada, okay? Um, but unfortunately, after an injury, he was not able to do that. So even though Keith was not very successful with, you know, dating anyone in high school or even, you know, having any interest from women in high school, girls in high school, he ended up meeting Ruth Huck and they got married when he was 20 years old, um, which was in 1975. And they ended up having three children together, two girls and one boy. And unfortunately, you know, since the police thing didn't work out, um, Keith ended up being a truck driver so he could support his family. So Ruth and Keith ended up being together for about 15 years, I think. And then they divorced in 1990, unfortunately. So 
I guess what happened was Ruth thought that Keith was cheating or having an affair. Um, she noticed that he would, you know, be getting like calls from random women at all times of the day and night and um, she just didn't know what was going on and she couldn't deal with that anymore. So they got a divorce. Then on January 23rd in 1990, this is when Keith kills his first victim. And her name was Tanya Bennett. So Keith met Tanya in a bar one night when they were in Portland, Oregon. And he ends up inviting her back to his place to hang out. Um, you know, just hang out, <laughs> chill. Just kidding, they were gonna do it, right? So, sorry, I shouldn't be joking about this because this is horrible, but so, anyways, refocus. Keith brings Tanya back to his place and they're, Keith is wanting to have sex with her and he gets turned down. And of course, Keith is not very happy about this, right? He's not exactly a gentleman, okay? So he gets pissed off. Um, he's like, you know, I thought that's what we were doing here. And she, you know, fights back. They get into an argument, which turns into a physical altercation. And he just beats the crap out of her. After he beats her, he's like nervous that she's going to go to the police about this. And to avoid her doing that, he just decides like, I'm going to have to kill her. So he strangles her to death and then he decides he's going to just go back to the bar because he wants people to see him there. You know, he wants to have an alibi that he was at the bar during um, the time when she went missing, which I still think to myself, like, um, can't people like see that they left together still and then he came back alone and that kind of thing? I mean, I almost feel like he should have stayed away from there, but I don't know. What's the smarter decision? I think either way, he was probably screwed in that case. So after he went to the bar, he came back to his place and he got her body and disposed of it in the Columbia River Gorge. So the next day, Keith ends up leaving town and Tanya's body is not found for a few days after he's gone. So Keith's not around. Um, they have no, you know, evidence on her body of any, you know, DNA or anything like that that they can test, which I don't even know, like around 1990, can they even do that at that point? I can't remember even when like DNA testing started to become like a real thing that they tested for and all of that, but, um, so yeah, they could not identify who the killer was. So of course this case goes into like the local news and a woman named Laverne Pavlinak, I think is how you say her name, Pavlinak. She decides that she will confess to this murder because she, well, really what she does is she, <laughs> calls the police station and she's like, I have a tip on who killed this girl. And it was actually my boyfriend. Um, she gives them all these details about what he did, where he was that night, all kinds of stuff. It was said that her boyfriend was abusive toward her. So she was trying to, you know, come up with some reason to get him in jail, basically get him away from her. So Laverne's boyfriend is called in for questioning and he takes a polygraph, um, which comes up saying he's deceptive on a few answers. So they didn't really get what they wanted from that, but they're still suspicious of him, obviously, because of this deception, right? They still aren't able to get him to confess or anything like that. So Basically, they have to let him go after questioning him for so long. Um, and 
when Laverne finds out that they're going to let him go, she's like, wait, I have more evidence. I found this square, like this patch of denim jeans in a room or somewhere in the house. And she's like, I know that it was said that part of Tanya's jeans were like ripped or missing from the crime scene. So she was like, I can pretend that I found that pair, that patch of jeans in our house. And so they do tests on the jeans and they are like, lady, these don't match up. These aren't the same jeans. Like, this isn't real. You know, what are you trying to do here? So then I think Laverne's just kind of like, okay, just stab myself in the eye. Okay, so Laverne's like, all right, I guess I gotta confess. Um, this whole time I was actually also involved in this murder. So she says basically they picked up Tanya while they were driving and um, one thing led to another. Her boyfriend ends up raping Tanya and then I don't really know what Laverne claimed her like part in this was but she, I guess because she was there and she helped him with the body or something like that, she is saying that, you know, she was an accomplice and all this stuff. Then they bring Laverne in to be questioned, right? And Laverne is like telling them all of these details about the story and the murder and how things happened. And it's a lot of detail that they, I guess, felt like just not a normal person or citizen would know about, right? They end up being like, okay, well, we don't have any any other suspects. And you're just coming up here telling this whole elaborate story with a lot of factual evidence. So it sounds like we should just take your word for it, I guess. So they take it to court and they end up going to prison, Laverne and her boyfriend, for this crime. However, to avoid the death penalty, Laverne's boyfriend ends up pleading guilty to the murder charge, and, and he ends up being sentenced to life in prison, and she only gets 10 years in prison. So at this point, Keith is getting a little pissed off, right? Because he's seeing Laverne and her boyfriend admit to this crime that he committed. So he's like over there, like, what can I do? Like, I need to get my name out there. You know, I need to set the record straight. It was not them. So what Keith ends up doing is he goes into the bathroom stall at a truck stop and he writes a little note on the bathroom stall. It's basically saying, like, I'm the one who killed Tanya and it's not these two people who are trying to claim that they did and um, something along those lines. If I can find like a picture of it, maybe I'll put it up here because I cannot remember exactly what it said, but it's something along the lines of like, these people are falsely confessing to this crime. It wasn't them. So someone ends up seeing this on the bathroom stall and they notify police and police come out. They can't find any you know, fingerprints or any evidence of who it could be. So it kind of just sits there and nothing really happens. So obviously Keith is like, damn, that didn't work. Gotta figure out something else. So he tries again um, on a bathroom stall at a truck stop that's a little bit closer to town. And once again, the police are notified and this time they're like, okay, this isn't just a joke anymore. Like, this might be something that we should like take more seriously, you know? But of course, like they still cannot figure out who the writer of this message is. So at this point, Keith is like, okay, I gotta take this a step further, you know? And he's like, I'm just gonna write the media directly. I'm gonna write the police office, whoever will hear my story. He writes to them letters. Um, basically giving details of the murder and, you know, what he did and all this stuff. And 
it was like an elaborate way of saying, you know, I'm still out here and I might kill again, so watch out. So every time he would write these letters to them, he would not sign his name or anything like that, but he would just put a creepy little smiley face at the bottom of the page. And obviously that is how he ends up getting his name, the happy face killer, right? Keith starts to kill again, and with every murder, he'll write the police office and the media, and um, basically he'll confess to the crime and all the stuff, tell them where the body is, all kinds of things. And always signing his notes with a smiley face every time. So with each new victim, the police still are not able to connect the person to the murderer. So, or to Keith, I should say. So the case is kind of like going cold and they're like, I don't know how we're ever going to figure out who did this because the women that Keith is killing are mostly prostitutes or... Um, I think there was a homeless woman, people who are hitchhiking, all that kind of thing where they don't have any personal connection to Keith, right? So they have no way of tying these women to Keith. So this ends up going on until 1995 when Keith ends up killing his own girlfriend. So Keith's side of the story is that his girlfriend was using him for money and he felt like, you know, justified in killing her for that reason. And his MO seemed to be strangulation and that's how most of his victims were killed. So at this point, um, police are kind of like, okay, the boyfriend is our first suspect, right? So they start looking into Keith, and they're thinking, okay, yeah, it's definitely this guy, right? About two weeks after he killed his girlfriend, Keith kind of knew, like, yeah, I'm definitely going to get caught for this. And he decided that he was going to try to kill himself. So he made two suicide attempts and failed both times. Um, I'm not sure what he tried to do to kill himself that he would have failed at, maybe taking pills or something like that. So after these suicide attempts don't work, Keith decides he's just going to turn himself in and hope for leniency. So once Keith turns himself in, he tells the police that his crimes have spanned, you know, over the course of five years from 1990 to 1995. He also told the police some like of the sicker things that he did to these victims of his. Um, one of the things like I told you he usually strangled his victims and he told them that he would actually strangle them and then you know, let them like come back to life almost and then strangle them again, just like torture. Like he just seemed to really like to play with them, torture them, tease them. He was pretty sick. Also a few days before Keith was arrested or Keith turned himself in, I should say, um, he sent a letter to his brother confessing that he had killed eight people within those five years. So Keith was later convicted and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. And after he was extradited back to California, he was convicted of another murder and another consecutive life sentence on top of the other ones. So at this point, you're probably wondering what happened to Laverne and her boyfriend, right? So even though Laverne kind of tried to like change up her story after she was convicted, right? She was like, I was just lying before. I didn't actually do it. I just wanted to get my boyfriend in jail and all this stuff. She tried to take it all back and they basically didn't care. They were like, you know what? You got yourself in this mess and I don't know if you're lying or not. Like obviously, you're not really gonna believe someone that says that, right? 
But really, it ended up being not until Keith confessed to all of this that Laverne and her boyfriend were released. Also, when Keith was arrested, he ended up telling police um, a few more specific details that um, only the killer would really know. Things that weren't in the media, things that nobody else could have known or found out about. Okay, so my video just cut off on me. What I was saying was I wanted to talk about his daughter really quick. So Keith's daughter wrote a book after all of this happened and she kind of just wanted to tell her side of the story of what it was like to grow up with Keith as a father and you know, how he was um, as a father and a serial killer on the side and um, what a confusing life and time that was for them. His daughter also did interviews and things like that with Dr. Phil and Oprah and just kind of talking about her life and everything. And those are really interesting if you can find those. Um, but one of her stories that she told was about when the kids were really little, um, they found some kittens in their backyard and they basically were like, hey dad, you know, what do we do with these stray kittens? And Keith was like, oh, you know, let me have them. And he took the kittens, okay, took them and hung them up on the clothesline in their backyard and basically tortured them in front of his children. And, you know, strangling them, hanging them there. I mean, just watching them squirm and I don't even know what else he did. But then the kids were like yelling at him to stop. They were crying, you know, I mean, so confused and upset and everything. And then later on that day, they found the kittens like dead in the backyard like out in their garden or something like that and I was just blown away by that and then there was another story that they had about um another cat that they had found when they were younger and it was a black cat and they brought it home and Keith strangled the cat and killed it in front of the kids crazy story right um, and then she also talks about just like little things that maybe they didn't pick up on when they were kids, but later on in life, they were like, oh, you know, maybe that was something that like should have stood out to us more. But now, you know, when we were kids, we didn't think anything of it. So one of those things was um, when they were driving in the car one day, a roll of duct tape like rolled out from under the seat. And... They thought that was kind of weird, like, why does dad have a roll of duct tape in the car? But, I mean, really, if you didn't suspect anything of your dad, you wouldn't think that's so weird, you know? It's just a roll of duct tape. He could have been using that for anything, you know? So, yeah. All right, guys, so I hope you liked this video. If you did, please hit the like button below. My dog is scratching on the door. Also, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Um, I put new videos out every Tuesday. Hopefully this one doesn't come out too late tonight because um, I had to refilm this ending because of my camera and, you know, just bear with me, okay? So anyways, turn on the notifications, do all the things. I love you guys and I hope you have the best week and I will see you next week. Bye.